Okay, hello there, Mr. Dunnan here, and today we're talking restriction enzymes. Let's get stuck in. Okay, so in today's lesson, we're looking at uh, enzymes or restriction enzymes. So imagine you're one of these bacteria, found these awesome cartoons today. Now, you're getting invaded by viruses. That doesn't sound very good, does it? So, virus comes in. Virus, virus, all trying to attack a bacterial cell. Bacteria, bacteria, attacked by virus, attacked by virus. Now, if you're a bacterial cell, you don't have much in the way of defences, do you? You're not like a person where you've got an immune system, where you've got active white blood cells that go and um, target these pathogens and kill them. Bacterial cells don't have them. So they've developed quite an unusual defence. Now, if I just move this out the way for a sec. So remember, bacterial cells are only single-celled organisms, okay? They've got their chromosome in a sort of a circular fashion, not linear DNA like in a normal, in a human or a eukaryotic cell. And they've also got these little um, circular other sections of DNA called plasmids, okay? So you've got no immune system, you've got no way of defending yourself against viruses where their whole goal is to inject their own genome, their own DNA or RNA into the cell and use the bacterial cell's own mechanisms of DNA transcription and then translation or RNA translation to create all of the components needed to make new viral particles. So what we're actually happening is we get the bacterial cell actually recreating more virus particles until we have so many that the cell lyses and they all explode out and they go and infect other bacterial cells. So I know you're asking yourself, well, how could they possibly defend against something like that with no immune system? Well, they've actually developed this really cool system. Let me just remove so bacterial cells have developed an enzyme, a protein enzyme that will go along and recognize specific sequences of DNA and then cut it. Why might that be helpful? Well, imagine you're getting infected by a virus that has its own DNA. If we could somehow recognize that sequence and cut it up into pieces, then we can no longer, well, the virus can no longer use our own mechanisms or our own machinery to produce more of those particles. Pretty cool, hey? So if we move along and recognize viral DNA sequences, cut it up into pieces, it can no longer um, be read in the same way and create the same sort of um, viral particles, whether they be enzymes or um, basically new viruses, because that's what we're making. So if we cut it up into pieces, that can't happen. So that's really cool. So remember, that's called, the things that do that, from bacteria are called a restriction enzyme. And when scientists found out about those, they thought, wow, we can actually use these ourselves. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So restriction enzymes can either cut in one of two ways. So they can either cut, so they recognize a sequence and then they can just cut straight along. So these are my restriction enzymes or genetic scissors as we like to call them in the game. And we're gonna cut along in between a set, of comp a set of bases. So now we've got two sections of DNA that were once together that are now cut. Now because they haven't exposed any free bases, we call that a blunt cut, leaving blunt ends. Okay, so restriction enzyme has recognized this sequence and it's now cut, leaving blunt ends. The other way that it could cut is go along, recognize a sequence, but instead of just cutting in a blunt fashion, it actually cuts like so. And here, so it cuts, and then leaves these TTAA exposed bases and TTAA exposed bases. Now, why did bacterial cells develop these two different mechanisms of cutting DNA or restricting DNA? If you've got any ideas or you'd like to let me know, please, Post them in the comments below, I'd love to hear your theories. Because um, there must have been some kind of 
selective pressure that allowed both of these to be successful ways of cutting up DNA. This one, as you'll notice, leaves these two sticky ends. So you understand that if we have these two sticky ends, they might then be able to rebind to each other. And geneticists have actually utilized that in genetic cloning and DNA fingerprinting. And we'll have a look at that later. So sticky ends or SNP blunt ends. Now scientists, scientists actually found out that we have, um, there's bacteria that produce lots of these restriction enzymes, okay? And these are some of the um, more common ones. So you'll see uh, this one and this one both create these blunt ends, the BAM H1, the HIN3 and the ECO R1, very common, all produce these sticky ends, okay? So how might we use them? Let's say we've got a gene of interest that we'd like to um, maybe replicate or clone, okay? What we can actually do is we can make sure or we can determine whether there are actual restriction locations outside of that gene of interest. If there are, we can use those to cut. So here you can see, this is my donor plasmid, so this has got the gene of interest that I want. If I apply an eco R1 and a NOT1 um, restriction enzyme, they will cut outside of my gene of interest, releasing my gene of interest, and then what actually gets tested upon in lots of exams is, do you understand that we would need to use the same restriction enzymes in our now recipient plasmid for us to create those sticky ends? One second. To create those sticky ends again, so in our um, recipient plasmid and our donor plasmid both have these sticky ends, we've just now increased the probability of them binding together. And that was a massive find for scientists. So we can cut our donor plasmid. It doesn't have to be a plasmid. It could be human DNA. It could be fungal DNA. It could be anything, as long as it's got restriction enzyme sites outside of our gene of interest. We then now uh, apply those same restriction enzymes to our, donor, our recipient plasmid. And now what we've got is we've got our gene of interest separated with sticky ends. And we've got our recipient plasmid also with these sticky ends. So you know what's going to happen? Of course, they're going to combine. Not always, but enough times that we can then use that. So once this plasmid so this part of um, the bacterial cell that I showed you earlier. Once that gene of interest and plasmid recombine, we can then allow it to come back into contact with bacter bacterial cells. And then those bacterial cells can replicate normally. And what are they replicating? Not just their own genome, but our gene of interest as well. And because we now create thousands and thousands of copies of bacterial cells, each one now with our gene of interest, this gene of interest is now going to be expressed and we can utilize that gene product. For example, this could be a human insulin gene, and now we're just making lots of human insulin protein, and we can take that protein, isolate it, and now we can then help lots of people with diabetes. Amazing stuff. So what we end up with is now a bacterial plasmid with our gene of interest inside. Now that's not the only time we use restriction enzymes. We also use restriction enzymes if we're at a crime scene. So we collect a sample of DNA, we then take that DNA and we apply restriction enzymes to it. And then what we end up creating, you've probably seen this before, is a DNA fingerprint. Okay. Now the reason why we get a DNA fingerprint is because our restriction enzymes always cut at the same location, don't they? That same sequence. But the distance between those um, same sequences those same number of cups, is going to be different. And because of that, they create different lengths of bands, and then when we run them through gel electrophoresis, if you're not sure about this, check out um, one of my other videos on DNA RNA probes. Uh, it should pop up just now, and you can have a look. But basically, we cut them into fragments with our restriction enzymes, run them through the gel, and then we can use that information to work out was there a particular suspect at the crime scene or who was the father. We can tell all that information. So if we look at this one here, 
You'll notice that at the crime scene here, we've got a sample of blood, and look, it matches our victim. So we imagine that our victim would be at the crime scene, but what we are after is was suspect one or suspect two also at the crime scene? So we look at our other sample of DNA, and we look for banding matching, because these I mean the same length of DNA, and look, we can say suspect two was at the crime scene. What were they doing there? They would then need an alibi. And we can do the same thing for paternity testing as well. So restriction enzymes in a summary came from bacteria where their own defense against viruses, we've now used those restriction enzymes and applied them to genetic engineering for our own benefit. Whether it's to clone a DNA or introduce a DNA into a plasmid, or whether it's to cut up um, DNA into, into um, or whether it's to cut up DNA into fragments and then run them on the gel to see um, a person's DNA fingerprint. So that's Mr. Dunner from Anytime Education. Hope you find that helpful. Uh, give me the thumbs up, subscribe. Um, all that stuff really helps. Check out our Facebook page and our website, anytimeeducation.com. Peace out.